I'm Eugene from SIAS. Thank you for joining us at Corporate Connect this afternoon. This webinar is organized by SIAS and supported by SGX. Today, we have with us Mr. Jeff Howie, market strategies from SGX to share on us on market updates, followed by a presentation by Mr. Eric Chu, CEO of Singapore ONG Limited. And we will end off with a Q&A session moderated by Mr. Eric Dyson, General Manager, Planning, Education and Research from CS. Without further ado, let us welcome our first speaker, Mr. Jeff Howie from SGX. Over to you, Jeff. Thank you very much, Eugene. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, the SGX market strategist at Singapore Exchange. And um, thankfully, uh, I will be providing an update over the next 15 minutes or so uh, on the current market drivers of Singapore stocks or the current highlights. So thankful uh, for CS for the invite um, to uh, have this 15 minutes before SOG uh, provide a corporate overview uh, of their business. Um, we must point out that for my part, the presentation is designed to be purely informative with recent observations in the moves of the stock market and in no way is providing investment advice. And here we are um, with a chart of the three year chart of the STI represented in blue and the FTSE ASEAN All Share Index represented in green. So for the 2021 20, uh, year uh, through to the close yesterday, uh, the Straits Times Index had been the third strongest performing benchmark across Asia with India's Nifty and Taiwan's TIAX taking the lead. Note that the ranking is uh, based, if you will, on Singapore dollar currency denomination, as the Stock Exchange of Thailand set index has, for instance, gained 13% more than the STI, but in Thai baht terms, that is, uh, with the 7% appreciation of the Sing dollar to the Thai baht, reducing that set index return in SGX, SG dollar terms to around 6%. So the STI has generated a 9% price gain with reinvested dividends boosting the total return to 12% as of the close yesterday. And I have the green line there because that is the regional benchmark that the STI is most correlated to. That's the FTSE ASEAN All Share Index represented by uh, that simple green line, which has a 93% correlation in daily close prices to the STI over the past three years. Um, Singapore stocks make up approximately 27% uh, of the weightage of the um, FTSE ASEAN All Share Index, uh, which has a total regional market value of 2 trillion US dollars. So for, for the blue line, the STI, uh, as you know, it comprises Singapore's 30 most actively traded and largest stocks by market value, and it's subject to quarterly rebalances uh, following the market close to, uh, is it tomorrow? No, it's Thursday. Following the Thursday market close, the results of the latest quarterly rebalance of the SDI and the FTSE ST index series uh, will be released. Um, so looking within the SDI, in the year thus far, Young Zijiang Shipbuilding has been the STI's strongest performing stock. The shipyards of the China-based shipbuilder, they are located in the north of Shanghai in the Jiangsu province, which is along the Yangtze River. And this year, its outstanding order book has grown to 8.7 billion US dollars for 167 vessels. Of this order book, orders for 112 of the 167 vessels with a contract value of 6.7 billion US dollars were actually made this year. So on the demand side, uh, there was an industry report back in mid August that noted that shipping container rates had continued to skyrocket this year with ocean trade approaching its peak season um, coming into Christmas, obviously. And um, it's, it's, it's continuing to be impacted, if you will, by these container imbalances that have been created by this demand surge of, on the reopening of the US economy. But at the same time, the strain on supply chains from port closures and slower turnaround rates, they have seen sur surging freight rates. Um, Drury Managing Director Philip Damas, I think was cited uh, in early August by CNBC, stating that factors have turned global container shipping into a highly disrupted undersupplied seller's market in which shipping companies can charge four to 10 times the normal price to move cargoes. So when re reporting its results, I think it was back on the 5th of August, Young Zijiang did cite a Clarkson's report as well that stated global new shipbuilding orders in the first half of this year made a seven year high, 
with a total um, contract value across the world for all the industry of more than 50 billion US dollars. And that was underpinned by a huge number of orders placed for container ships, which accounted for more than half of the new shipbuilding orders across the world in the first half of this year. So, so far, as we said, Yangtze Jiang shipbuilding, it's been the strongest STI stock this year. It's generated 70% uh, excess return um, in price with dividends boosting the total return to 78% as of the close yesterday. But on the other side of the equation, as we said, the STI is made up of 30 stocks. City Developments has been the STI's least strongest stock with an 11% decline in total return in the 2021 year through to yesterday's close. Um, back on the 12th of August, City Developments it did report that all its business segments of the group were in positive territory in the first half of this year, except for hotel operations. Uh, it did note, however, the hospitality business has begun to show green shoots of recovery, evident from the second quarter of this year. And since reporting on the 12th of August, the share price of City Developments gained something like 5% from the uh, 11th August closed because uh, the company reported in the morning of the 12th of August. So it, it's moved from $6.61 on the 11th of August close to around $6.97 at yesterday's close. And then you include a three cent dividend that went ex dividend on the 23rd of August. Um, since the company has reported its first half numbers, it has seen a total return of 7% positive, which has trimmed that decline in the year to date to down 11%. Should also mention that when you're looking across at the STI, we do list those two exchange traded funds that invest in the 30 constituents of the index. The two STI ETFs, they did draw significant investor participation in the 10 months from March 2020 through to the end of December 2020. There was more than 900 million Singapore dollars of net inflows, which amounted to more than half of the combined inflows of the two STI ETFs over the past decade. And for that 10 month period, the volume weighted average price for the Spider STI ETF was $2.64. And the volume weighted average price over the 10 months for the Nico AM STI ETF was $3.16. Through to yesterday's close, something like 20% total returns on those 10 month VWAP prices. So also, I guess, parallel, I should mention to those SDI ETF inflows over those important 10 months of March, 2020 through to December, 2020, the current 30 SDI stocks saw 6.6 .6 billion Singapore dollars of net retail inflow over the same 10 months. Now, if you exclude the three banks, which have large market cap and obviously account for much of the flow, uh, if you exclude the three banks though, the remaining 27 stocks, so the STI X banks, saw $3.9 billion of net retail inflow over the 10 month period, um, March through to DEC uh, last year. And since then, through to the um, end of last week, those, those 27 stocks have received more net retail inflows, around $1.6 billion of net retail inflow in the year to date. Now, among the 27 stocks, Singapore Telecommunications, as we all know and love as Singtel, has seen uh, its largest net retail inflow, the largest net retail inflow of all the SDI stocks in the 2021 year through to the 28th of August. It's seen around $333 million of net retail inflows, while Yangtze Jiang Shipbuilding had the largest net retail outflow. Um, that net retail outflow was around $336 million so far this year. And as we said before, um, that has coincided with Yangtze Jiang rallying to around a 70% gain in the year to date in terms of price gains. Um, but back on the 12th of August, I should also point out that uh, Singtel did report a turnaround in its first quarter um, ending 30 June uh, for its FY22. That turnaround was a 445 million Singapore million dollar net profit from a net loss of 20 million in the same first quarter um, back in 2020, in that first quarter ending in June. Um, and that was uh, on the back of improved operating and business environments, and of course, a stronger Australian dollar for its Optus business. Now, since the 26th of July through to yesterday's close, Singtel has outpaced the global telecommunications sector as well. Singtel has gained around 7%, while the US $4 trillion telecommunications sector 
has generated flat returns. Um, and I guess on a final note, while we're looking at this chart, um, the big global drivers, there is obviously, um, there was a lead up of more, I guess, hawkish, hawkish uh, insights from Fed members over the past six weeks or so on asset tapering, which, um, which has also coincided with, I guess, deceleration in the year on year growth of the US um, money supply and to a wider extent, the global money supply. And the Fed has continued on with this, um, I guess this narrative in, at the Jackson Hole um, with the, some more tapering foresight. However, on the, I guess the really key driver or the third key driver, I guess, of, of liquidity in risk markets, which include equities um, and commodities and currencies are of course interest rates. And the uh, Fed chair has maintained that the individual opinions that did, um, I guess, provide some transparency on the timing of the tapering, which is potentially coming at the end of this year. Um, it's, I guess, less, less, um, less, less, less the, the tapering, the, I guess the individual opinions are a little bit more discounted when it comes to interest rate movements. And the chair has maintained that individual dot plots do not form a FOMC decision and so forth. And the Fed chair, and I guess the more dovish members of the Fed have maintained that the consideration of the Delta variant and its impact on the US labor market does remain a priority before US looks to lift interest rates. Um, on the COVID-19 uh, across the world, I think thankfully we've seen some recent momentum just in the last week or so that the new globally confirmed cases since that we the acceleration, I guess, that we saw in um, in the last 10 weeks from, from mid to late June, it has decelerated in recent weeks. However, one key measure is that seven day rolling average of new daily confirmed cases. It has not been able to break below 350,000 cases a day this year. And I think that will remain a key objective breaking below that 350,000 cases a day um, going into 2022. I should uh, point out on the banks because this is a very important part of our STI, um, more so even our MSCI Singapore index. The trio of DBS, OCBC and UOB, they make up 20% of our total market cap of all stocks listed on SGX, which is around uh, 900 billion Sing dollars total. Um, they also make up 20% of the day-to-day -day turnover, which is around 1.2 to $1.3 billion in, 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 in the recent few months. And the three banks, they do make up more than 40% of the STI. So far this year, or since I, um, right through to uh, the close yesterday, the three banks have averaged 21% total returns. And that's closely in line with global banks. The top quartile of global banks by market value are up similarly up 19% in the year to date. And the global bank indices are around up 20% plus in the year to date. Um, globally, banks have been supported by resilient investment activity all across the globe and a generally steeper yield curve supporting um, banks that obviously borrow short and lend long. So that has supported banks um, more so in the earlier part of this year. Uh, for the second quarter of this year, um, DBS, OCBC and UOB, they reported combined net interest income of $5.13 billion. That was up 1% uh, from $5.08 billion in the first quarter of this year. And for the trio, this was one of the highest quarter on quarter increases in combined net interest income um, since I think the second to third quarter of, of uh, FY19. The growth drivers for the bank continue to be digitalization broadening wealth management services, and that continued focus on supply chains and their growth markets. As uh, illustrated in the bottom left chart, we can see combined wealth management net fee and commission income, the DBS, OCBC, and UOB has almost tripled um, over the last seven years from near 700 million in the first half of FY14 to close to $2 billion in the first half of this year. The combined wealth management net fee um, and commission income of the trio in the first half of this year increased 21% sequentially from the second half of last year. And that was the strongest sequential growth since something like 30% plus growth um, in the first half of 
FY17 from the back end, the last second half of the FY16. So wealth management, as we said, it's earmarked as a growth segment going into 2022. UOB has noted that wealth management fees reached record levels um, this year amid returning investment at confidence on the market recovery. Uh, similarly, I should also mention IFAS Corporation. It did note as a result of its groups, uh, what was it, its groups assets under uh, administration, its recurring net revenue continued to grow at a robust play, pace, increasing more than 30% year on year uh, in the first half of 2021 and 30 June. So looking, for, looking ahead, as, um, as highlighted in an industry blue paper, Morgan Stanley and Oliver Wyman report uh, back at the back end of last year, wealth management businesses, they should be doubling down on technology investments, strategically cutting costs, building differentiated product offerings, and considering inorganic opportunities. So just to um, one more uh, final slide, just to quickly go over the significant sector and industry rotations we've seen over the past uh, 18 months. Um, this is a heat map of the monthly performances of all the different sectors in the Singapore stock market uh, over, well, I think I've got two years of data here. Um, there's a great deal of liquidity um, in the market over the past, uh, let's say 18 months or so, 12 to about 18 months or so. And that has seen a, a, around a 17% performance differential on average between the least performing sector in Singapore and the best performing sector in Singapore over the past 18 months, with the median gain of the top performer, um, top performing sector since Feb 2020 at around 13%, with a median 4% decline for the least performing sector. So that liquidity, if you will, has was bolstered by uh, three main things, as we said, on the monetary policy front, the low interest rates, which continue to be low, the asset purchases, which are looking to be tapered um, at the end of this year. And thirdly, the, I guess, the excessive year on year growth of the US money supply, which has been decelerating, as we said, since March. So with the, with the um, gradual normalization of monetary policy, while you would expect sector rotations to continue, possibly the veracity and the speed with which they've happened um, could start to be reduced with less liquidity in the market. Okay, and each sector will, of course, um, have its own intrinsic drivers, as we noted um, with the shipbuilders before, and of course, the hotel airline stocks as well. But for the tech sector, so far this year, we've got these, I guess, these six technology stocks that rank among our top 50 traded stocks. Um, they are Venture Corporation, AM Holdings, UMS Holdings, Nanofilm Technologies International, ISDN Holdings and Franken Group. They've all ranked among our top 50 stocks this year while generating uh, median total returns just under 40% so far this year. I think it um, also this month we saw ISDN, it reported its, its highest uh, semi-annual net profit. Um, UMS noted its first half FY revenue surpassed 100 million mark for the first time and AEM Holdings also reported its second highest first half of the year on record. Uh, utilities, I should also mention, have been comparatively defensive, with Singapore's five most traded utility stocks being Semcorp Industries, Keppel Infrastructure Trust, Union Gas Holdings, China Everbright Water, and SIIC Environment. They've averaged, uh, they averaged around 20% plus total returns, uh, with a median gain similar, just under 20% in the 2021 year through to the 24th of August. But as you can see on that far right of this heat map, commodity gains have impacted sector performances over the first seven months and eight months, if you will, of this year. Energy and materials have outpaced banks this year on a market cap weighted basis. Um, well, the tech regulation remains in focus, particularly in China, with the tightening of regulations for technology companies, because the industry is becoming so increasingly consumer market orientated. Most of the sectors for the China stock market have been in the red in the quarter to date, um, with the exception of resources and materials 
and industrials. Um, resources and materials has been the strongest sector in the China stock market in the year to date. And interest in the sector has extended to China-based stocks listed here in Singapore. Uh, with Jutian Chemical, the, um, the most traded catalyst stock here in Singapore over the past eight months, it's ranked as a top 40 stock by turnover, trading around 8 million Singapore dollars a day. Um, while the stock has generated a 4% total return over the uh, year to date through to yesterday's close, it did gain 382% last year. Its main product, um, DMF, has a diversified range of applications, which include being, I think, a feedstock for polyurethane and pharmaceutical goods, as well as being an industrial solvent. That commodity impact on, on stock sector performances um, has also been largely driven by uh, COVID-19 led constrained supplies, industrial sectors recovering faster than consumer sectors, agriculture stockpiling, OPEC supply management, of course, in addition to this decline in the US dollar um, and the decline in the US dollar index, which does provide a benchmark for most global commodity markets and hence does have a direct impact on the cost of US dollar um, price commodities. As, as we detailed in uh, as we saw is detailed uh, recent sensitivity analysis by Rex International Fortress Minerals, the weakening of the US dollar can increase profits for commodity explorers, while the strengthening of the US dollar can have the opposite effect. So Singapore's five most traded upstream resources, stocks, uh, or, or commodity related stocks, upstream resources, I should say, um, uh, explorers, producers, and so forth. Rex International, RH Petrogas, Fortress Minerals, Golden Energy and Resources, and Geo Energy. Um, they've generated median total returns of around 70% in the 2021 year to date, ranging from 32% for Rex International to 428% for RH Petrogas. So a little bit of a, a, a asymmetric um, pricing, but nonetheless, that commodity. Um, impact that we've seen across the markets has obviously, as we can see, impacted our sector performances as well. So I'm, I will end here. I'll just also, um, if I can just have one minute, just to plug our, our recently launched channel of Telegram, uh, colloquially called SGX Invest. We encourage you to find us on Telegram. The channel does provide us with a means to um, send, usually once daily, uh, relevant insights, uh, more on events such as this. Uh, and of course, if you do prefer to um, receive once a week emails, our SGX My Gateway report has been running for quite some time. It has had a lot of support from CIOS, which we are very thankful for. And uh, we distribute that every Monday night. Um, if you're not receiving either of those, um, don't hesitate to, uh, to let us know. Contact CIOS or you can contact us anytime. Okay, so I'll, 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 I'll stop my sharing and I will mute and look forward, really looking forward to this next presentation. Thanks, Eugene. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for sharing. And next, we are pleased to welcome Mr. Eric Chu, CEO of Singapore ONG and Limited. He will share with, with us more about the company. Sir, please. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us during your lunchtime for this webinar. I'm Eric Chu, CEO of Singapore ONG Limited. I'll be taking you through this corporate presentation and answer some of your questions after this presentation. Just a disclaimer, this presentation has been reviewed by our sponsor, but not examined by, but not examined and approved by the Singapore Stock Exchange. For today's presentation, I will cover the following areas. Firstly, overview of SOG and our services. Next, I'll move on to talk, share a little bit more about our specialist medical practitioners followed by financial highlights for our first half uh, result announcement, and then lastly, corporate updates and future plans. These are our services. Uh, it remains the same with four business segments, that is ONG, cancer-related, 
pediatrics and dermatology. For cancer-related segment, we have added new services in first half of 2021 this year, and that is thyroid and colorectal surgery, diagnostic and therapeutic endoscopic procedures. With these new services, it has now expanded our list of medical offerings to our patients and their families. These are our networks of clinics. We are strategically located in most established private hospitals and medical centers in Singapore. Okay. Next, please allow me to introduce our specialist medical practitioners. SOG has 16 specialists comprises, comprised of seven ONG specialists, four pediatricians, three cancer specialists, and two dermatologists. Let's take a closer look at who they are. Our ONG specialist, the gentleman on the left is Dr. Bae Suan Chong, who is also our executive chairman. Then we have Dr. Chu Wan Ling. And then the lady on the right is Dr. Heng Tong Lan. She's our founder and executive director. Our other ONG specialist, we have Dr. Hong Zi Chin and Dr. Lee Kin Wai, who is also our founder and executive director. Then we have Dr. Natalie Chua and Dr. Clara Ong. These are our three cancer specialists, and two of them have just recently joined the group. In April, sorry, um, on the left, you have Dr. Cindy Pang, who is our gynae oncologist. So in April 2021, we have onboarded a new corrector surgeon, Dr. Sim Sien Ling, and she has started our new uh, clinic by by the name uh, Corrector, SOG Corrector Endoscopic and General Surgery Clinic at Mount E Novena Specialist Center. And in June 2021, we have our new breast and thyroid surgeon, Dr. Tan Chuan Chen, on board. And we have started our new breast, thyroid, and general surgery clinic at Glenigas Medical Center. These are our two dermatologists. We have uh, Dr. Joyce Lin and Dr. Liu Huiyin. These are our two pediatricians. We have Dr. Lim Xie Yan and Dr. Irene Teo, and both of them are general pediatricians. And lastly, we have these uh, two pediatricians who have uh, sub specializations. Dr. Christina Ong is a pediatric gastroenterologist, and Dr. Petrina Wong is a pediatrician who sub specializes in respiratory and sleep. Next, let's move on to the financial highlight. We have announced our first half 2021 financial performance a few weeks ago. This is our first half of 2021 financial result in comparison to the corresponding period last year. For top line revenue, all our four business segments posted an increase in revenue for first half of 2021. And this is due mainly to the increase in patient load. For other operating income, uh, we posted a decrease in government, uh, other operating income, and this is due to the decrease in government grants for COVID-19 support scheme, such as job support scheme, foreign workers levy, levy rebates, and property tax rebates. Consumables and medical supply use, we have posted an increase, and this is largely due to the increase in patient load. Employee remuneration expense, we have saw an increase in terms of the amount for first half of 2021, and this is due mainly to a higher bonus provision for our specialist medical practitioners, clinical and management staff for first half of this year. Depreciation remains relatively constant year, period to period. Other operating expense, uh, there's a slight increase, and this is due to the increase in marketing and administrative expenses. So with the income tax expense of 900,000 for first half of 2021, the group has posted a net profit after tax for the period for first half of 2021 at 4.5 million versus last year 3.8 million net profit after tax. Let's take a closer look at the group past year performance in comparison to our first half of 2021 results. The chart on the left shows our revenue over the last four years, and uh, we also shows the first half of 2021 revenue uh, level at 21 million. And uh, in com comparison to last year, first half, we, post we have achieved an increase of 3.2 million, which is 17.9%. 
The chart on the right shows the revenue by business segment. The inner circle is the um, first half of 2020 result last, last year. And the outer circle represents the current first half, current year first half uh, revenue numbers. So as you can see, the largest uh, increase in terms of revenue comes from our dermatology for first half of 2021. Uh, dermatology has posted an increase of 1.4 million, which represents about 48% increase in comparison to last year. The next segment is our ONG segment. Uh, we posted an increase of 1 million, which is about 10% in comparison to the last year uh, revenue numbers. Then uh, the third segment is uh, our pediatric segment. We have achieved an increase of 0 0.7 million, 30% growth compared to last year. And then the last segment is 0 0.1 million for increase in revenue for our cancer-related segment. And this represents about 3.8%. The chart on the left shows the profit for operations over the last four years and also, of course, our current uh, first half uh, numbers. We have posted uh, a, a profit from operation of about 5.5 million for first half of 2021. And this is an increase of about 900,000, 21% in comparison to the same period last year. And the chart on the right shows the profit from operation by business segment. As you can see, uh, all our segment has posted an increase in terms of the profits, uh, except for cancer related due to a change in the doctors. Next, ne next, prof, uh, next slide shows the net profit after tax. Based on SOG uh, current trading share price at 26 cents, our first half of 2021 earnings per share of with our earnings per share of uh, 0 0.95 cent. SOG is currently trading at around 14 times PE. And uh, our earnings per share in comparison to last year, uh, we have uh, posted an increase of 0 0.15 cents and that represents about 19%. Next slide shows the net tangible assets. The group has a net tangible asset value as at 30th June 2021 at 29.7 million, uh, down 1.1 million, which is about 3.6%. 3 and this is due to uh, FY 2020 final, final dividends payout of 5.7 million in May 2021. And with that, our net tangible asset value per share is at 6.24 cents. And down, this, uh, there's a slight decrease of 0 0.24 cents. And, at 3.7%. In terms of financial position, um, this is our balance sheet. The group is financially strong with no borrowings and debt securities. The group's cash balances stood at 31 million as at 30th June 2021. For FY 2021, the board has already declared an interim dividend payout of 0 0.65 cents and this represents 68.5% of the group distributable profits. Comparing to the corresponding period pre previous years, this is an increase of 0 0.15 cents or 30%. The interim dividends will be paid on 6 September 2021. Lastly, let's move on to the group's updates and future plans. The chart on the left side shows the historical live birth in Singapore. With Singapore's stagnant annual birth rate hovering around 39,000 babies, many investors wonder about the growth of SOG. Hence, it's our need to reiterate that our ONG specialists provide more than just delivering of babies. In fact, they provide a comprehensive suite of services catering to the health of female reproductive system throughout a woman's life cycle and that is for fertility planning to gynecological services. Over the years, we have also expanded from one medical segment that is ONG to four medical segments in our business, and that is pediatric, dermatology, and cancer related. So the chart on the right shows the number of babies that SOG has delivered over the years, and also our first half 2021 number of babies that we have delivered. Even even though the group has delivered 55 baby lesser as compared to the corresponding period last year, our ONG segment has po had posted an increase in revenue of about 1 million or 10% for first half of 2021, 
as compared to the previous year. First, our growth in the revenue for O&G segment in the first half of 2021 is mainly attributed to the increase in gynecological services that we rendered. Next, let's, let's take a look at the number of surgeries that we have performed. The chart on the right shows the number of gynae oncological sur surgeries that we have performed for the last few years and also first half of 2021. For first half of 2021, we have saw that there is an increase in terms of the number of cases by 88 cases. And then uh, this represents about 72% increase compared to last year, first half of 2020. Then the chart on the right shows the number of breast and corrector surgeries that we have done. Uh, there is a dip in first half of 2021. Uh, this is due to a change in breast surgeon. And our new corrector surgeon has just came on board and started the clinic in April 2021. Lastly, let's move on to the future plans. We are still, our future plan premise based on these four pillars, strengthen, recruit, referrals, grow, and partnerships. For strengthen, we continue to strengthen our SOG brand awareness and increase market share. For recruit, it represents the organic growth of our future plans, and that is to recruit more specialist medical practitioners to strengthen all our business segment. The third pillar, talks about the referrals. We want to increase the level of interclinic referral through synergy awareness. And fourth pillar is the growth. We will continue to grow our non ONG business segment to increase the re their revenues and profit contribution to the group. So as we are well established for our ONG services, we would like to grow our non ONG that is the other three business segment. The last pillar is talking about partnership. This is on an ongoing basis, and some of these will bring us new patient loads while we continue to look out for overseas partnership opportunities. With that, this ends my presentation. And please follow us on all our social media platforms for more updates on SOG. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eric. We will proceed to the Q&A session. You may post a question, a question in the comment section below, and due to time constraint, we'll endeavor to answer them. Can I have the moderator, Mr. Richard Dyson, General Manager, Planning, Education and Research, CS, and Mr. Eric Chu, CEO of Singapore ONG Limited, to kickstart this session. Thank, thanks, Eugene. Thanks, uh, Eric, for joining us today. I think it's a uh, uh, congratulations. I think that a very um, very good results, you know, I think following, you know, especially with COVID-19, uh, especially earlier, I mean, uh, a year ago now, I think we're seeing the effects, uh, especially the easing of uh, restrictions helping. And how, how has this been, you know, really, really on the ground with, with, with some of the other subsidiaries? And I think you also have other subsidiaries. Uh, how have they helped uh, with the opening of these restrictions, easing of these restrictions? Thank you very much, uh, Richard, and thank you very much, Sia, for having us on this platform. And I think it's also our first time doing this Facebook Live with Sia, and uh, you know, we, we, we appreciate this opportunity. So uh, back to the questions, uh, I think with uh, COVID pandemic, uh, or you know, when the virus first started off, you know, everyone starts to put in place uh, safety precautionary measures. Uh, some of these are really uh, compli compliance uh, matters that we are talking about by MOH, Ministry of Health. So with that, uh, you know, I think when, when, when we first had that implementation last year and also the circuit breaker last year, uh, you know, it is a challenge to all our clinics. We have, so today we have 16 clinics across island wide. So it posed uh, you know, a, a challenge because uh, it's a new protocol and uh, the clinical staff are actually adopting all this protocol for the safety and well-being of all our patients and their families. So um, this is something that, you know, um, over time, I think uh, our staff and in fact, patients and their families have gotten used to it. Uh, it can range from as simple as a safe entry to the point of uh, last year where we have implemented uh, whereby you, they have to do a health declaration 
uh, to declare, you know, have they been to China and all these different questionnaires that we have to roll out. And it's really inconvenience to everyone. But, you know, having said that, I think it is a good protocol, good protocol for us to adhere to so that we can also help in terms of contact tracing if there's any case, suspected cases that happens. Yeah. So I think we are doing much better this year because, you know, we have been used to it and uh, we have also created uh, or streamlined certain processes to make it more efficient. Initially, when it first holds, this whole pandemic started, a lot of investors were thinking, I thought investing in the healthcare sector was a defensive strategy. How is it that they found so be affected? And I think we came to a realization that even in a pandemic, it doesn't, you know, I mean, it doesn't mean that you know, healthcare is not affected. But what we've seen now is a tremendous improvement. And I think you know, we'll see a lot of, of new of everyone coming back. And I, I think that is the strength of the, the importance of vaccination and everybody, the whole system coming back stronger uh, and more resilient uh, to, to take us through um, to, to the next level. I think um, there's a misconception here or misunderstanding because, uh, you know, for COVID um, outbreak, I think it has affected all businesses in one yeah. way or another. For, you know, healthcare services, uh, it really depends on, you know, uh, what types of medical services or healthcare services that we are providing. So it has to be essential services that is then therefore uh, warrant us to continue to serve our patient, to see our patient. If it's non-essential services uh, during the outbreak last year and particularly during the COVID uh, circuit breaker last year, the last the two months, last year, April and May, we are supposed to defer all these non-essential services to a later date, you know, upon the green lights from MOH. So during the two, two months, uh, I would say that uh, uh, some of this procedure uh, we are not able to do. But fortunately, because uh, we are a group that provide uh, most of our services are considered essential, except for a, a few procedures or certain uh, you know procedures that are really non-essential, such as aesthetic treatments, you know, like Botox, fillers, you know, um, these are the one that is considered as non-essential, and therefore we have to do. Essential, you know, because looking good is essential. <laughs> We, we believe in that, but unfortunately, we have to follow the rules. <laughs> um, that's true. So let me just, just share some questions we've, uh, we've had. You know, I mean, I think we're still waiting for questions coming up. Um, so the, the ONG had performed better than other non-ONG segments, contributing to more than half of the revenue in the first half of, of the FY uh, of the year 2021. But this could come at expense of higher corresponding employment costs. So what is the breakdown of the employee uh, remuneration? Because we noted about like 10, 10 million plus of remunerations attributed. How much of this is attributed to the ONG sector? Okay, I would like to share that, you know, um, out of this 10 million, uh, okay, this, this employee remuneration expense will continue to increase in the event of you know, our expansion to have more clinics, more headcount, more doctors on board, this number will increase. So uh, based on that number as of first half of 2021 at 10.1 million, ONG comprised of about 46%, uh, which is around 4.7 4 million, you know, in, in terms of that number. Um, so if you look at our number of uh, doctors that we have, uh, 16 specialists out of which ONG almost represents 50%. So I think this number here is, uh, you know, it makes sense because it's about 46% of the total amount that we are talking about. Yeah. So, so, it's about, so it's about, uh, at the end of the day, it's about people. At the end of the day, you're running a lot of it is, is, is people driven. Yes. Uh, correct. And how do you really manage, you know, what, recently there are also some concerns, you know what I mean? when you're dealing with doctors and so forth, how do you manage reputational risks? Um, because yeah. I, these are some of the challenges. And I, I think, you know, I mean, as, a, as an organization yourself, you know, we've, we've seen, you know, some situations, I think, in the press lately, you know, of, uh, so how do you manage repu reputational risk as an organization with the various different doctors that you've got? Yeah, I, 
you are absolutely right. Managing people is a challenge and particularly managing doctors, I would say that. So in order to talk about, you know, how do we make sure that we have good reputation? It all starts from the day that we go out and we do our recruitment. That means the day that we recruit um, you know, we, does our, we do our recruitment uh, to bring in new doctors, right? Uh, that is very key because we want to do, we want to have an assessment of the doctor's candidate to assess them based on, you know, their values and what they believe in, in terms of medicine, right? So we want to bring in uh, doctors who have good ethical, uh, uh, you know, medical practices or rather doctors who practice good medicines. And we are not, although we are a listed company, uh, we we do not um, you know uh, advocate to tell our doctors that you know look each year you have to increase by a certain percentage. Okay, all we care of is really for our patient and their families. We want to make sure that all our clinic provide the best excellent patient care to our patient, and our doctors really do what is necessary and for the best for our patients and families. So uh, in terms of that, I will describe that as a culture. We need to have a good culture. Um, and here we are in human capital business. So therefore, culture is a key important aspect in terms of uh, how we manage our reputation. With a good culture, you reduce the reputation, a bad reputation, you know, that will evolve eventually. So we want to advocate to our doc all our doctors. In fact, we often tell our doctors, don't worry about the numbers, you will do well. Just make sure you do the best for the patient. Which brings in very nicely, since you brought culture up, uh, because culture and performance, and, and a lot of times these days, you know, non-financial information, and in, especially we talk about sustainability. Uh, I, I, this is very, and it's really an ideal time to bring up sustainability of companies and, and culture here. So what are some of the initiatives? I mean, you, you started talking a little bit about this, but having the right recruitment. How do you then you know, look in terms of putting in some processes and also talking about besides financial information, uh, disclosures, sustainability practices, uh, initiatives on um, social environmental ESG initiatives. Could you share a little bit more in terms of what are the initiatives that uh, uh, Singapore ONG is taking in these areas? I think as a group and in terms of the, uh, our board, um, board of directors, I think uh, the organization is, uh, you know, we are at the forefront, so-called, uh, in a way whereby we have adopted sustainability reporting and initiative the day that we got listed in 2015. So I think all this year we have been, you know, a, a strong advocate in terms of uh, Sustain, talking about sustainability within the group. So um, a few key areas that I'd like to touch on is that, you know, in terms of our sustainability report, we, we go through an a in-depth understanding of who are our stakeholders, what are our material issues, and then from there onwards, we, we talk to this group of stakeholders. So I can share with you some of these uh, initiatives that we have done oh, yes, in the of this group. Yeah. So for our patients and their families, a lot of times, uh, we we are, we have a close relationship with the fam with the patients and family because our doctor sees them on a day to day basis, and also uh, we also conduct medical forums, uh, public forums, webinars, and we 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 co we, we are the organizers, and then we co uh, we bring in some of the vendors to share some of their product knowledge with our patients and their families. And I think this is good for educational purposes. Then also for shareholders and the financial communities per, per se, I think uh, you know, we are here today to do this event with Sias and this is part of our engagement with our shareholders and also the investment uh, investors community. For employees, uh, we really look into their well-being and also some of the benefits and also uh, you know, benchmark to what is the current market practices as well. So such things uh, will include even direct in-depth engagement with them on quarterly basis or ad hoc town hall meetings. Then we also do team bonding for ad hoc team bonding and company events. I think most companies does that. Then uh, in terms of our local community, we are um, so-called advocates you know, to 
return back to society and we have been doing donations and also even to the extent that we close our clinic half a day annually just to you know work together with touch community we have last year what we did is that we had our doctors nurses and directors all go down to serve the underprivileged which is two blocks of rented flat the seniors staying there we distributed uh you know um, well wellness bag includes masks sanitizers and daily necessity to help them you know during these covid times these are some of the things that we have been doing to help you know with the local community as well so these are some of the many ways that we, we do for sustainability we have a question from from the from the uh, from the audience is that would you share the potential risks of your business model in the long run i think the risk is often the uh, the talent so talent means the our specialist medical practitioner we must continue to uh, make sure that you know sog provide a good platform for all practitioner to come on board and also to stay on as long as they can and hopefully what retire with sog so that is the uh, key challenge and we are slowly trying to put in place uh, changes to make it better so that you know our practitioner will will enjoy working with sog as a group Thank you, Eric. I think we are almost running out of time, uh, but maybe just one last question because I think everybody is still talking about this, uh, and they're very happy. You know, shareholders have received a dividend of uh, sixty-five cents for the first half of uh, twenty twenty-one, with a payout of about sixty uh, over sixty-eight percent. You know, assuming of the net profits, this payout percentage seems relatively high, and everybody say, "Yay!" You know, what I mean. Uh, will this trend continue going forward? You know, will they ex- continue to expect this? Uh, and how is the company going to impact the company's retained earnings in the future, especially for expansion, growth, uh, acquisitions? And do you re- and do you have like a dividend policy in place? You know, could you share this? Uh, I think this will be a good uh, question to, to round up this whole session today. Sure. So uh, to address uh, the questions, uh, probably I think the. Uh, dividends policy question first. Uh, we do not have a formalized dividend policy. However, having said that, I think based on the historical trend, we have been paying out dividends up to eighty five percent of our um, each year's earning, and we hope to continue to do that to reward all our shareholders. And uh, for our half year, that's sixty eight point five percent of our retained earnings, or rather, the net profit after tax, is something that uh, you know we have done well, and it is naturally you know we hope to give back to our shareholders for their loyalty and strong support. So the next question is that you know how do we make sure that we have sufficient uh, you know reserve or fundings for future acquisition or uh, you know expansion plan? So uh, I think based on our current cash reserve. We are at thirty one million based on our half year as of thirty first. Uh, sorry, thirty of June um, balance sheet numbers. So we do have. Uh, we are careful with our spending. We are conservative and prudent with our spending. So uh, we only spend on things that are necessary. We have implemented cost control as well. So that cash reserve is actually built up for that purpose. So in the case, in the event of any rainy days, we do. Have can tap on onto this reserve, and with that eighty five percent payout, fifteen percent will then go back to that cash reserve. So we hope that you know this is something that, uh, I think based on the current uh, assessment, we we are still sufficient in terms of how we look at you know that. But of course, if something that is lucrative in terms of business expansion and we need uh, significant funding, you know, uh, and that is one of the reason why we are listed. We can always have. Uh, you know, do it on the equity mode. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. And I also know that I think you you got to re-emphasize that you have no debt. You know what I mean? And and if any uh, expansion, you can there are many other ways of, of funding any further acquisitions. I know you recently made an announcement about something in a JV in Malaysia as well. That's right. Uh, so so I, we can see that your plans to grow the business is is obviously there. Uh, yes. And thank you for uh, spending the time. Uh, 
with us uh, today. Uh, over to you, Eugene. Thank you. Thanks, Richard and Eric, for being with us this afternoon. We have come to the end of today's webinar. It has been a pleasure to have you with us today. In case you missed any part of today's session, you can rewatch the webinar on CR's Facebook page. Do like our page and check out our website to get updates on our upcoming investor education programs and initiatives. Thank you and have a great day ahead. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.